Welcome to another episode of Real American Heroes. You know, we ought to name this broadcast, Now It Can Be Told. I'm Oliver North, and our guests today are Captain Royce Williams, United States Navy retired, and Rear Admiral Don Shelton, U.S. Navy retired. Captain Royce Williams, United States Navy retired, was a naval aviator during the Korean War. What many don't know is that Soviet pilots secretly flew operations against NATO and U.S. forces. On the 18th of November, 1952, in an exhausting 35-minute dogfight against seven Soviet MiGs, then Lieutenant Royce Williams became the only American aviator to single-handedly shoot down four Russian MiGs in a single sortie. That's the kind of record that will never again be broken. This heroic act was never revealed, kept classified for nearly 50 years. After the Cold War ended, the Russian government confirmed the loss of the four MiG-15 aircraft. For over seven years, Admiral Don Shelton has been working on upgrading Captain Williams' recognition by awarding him the Medal of Honor. Both Captain Williams and Admiral Shelton are here to tell this story, and it's remarkable. Captain Royce and Admiral Shelton, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Admiral Shelton here, glad to be here. Glad to see you, uh, Colonel North. And uh, for me, likewise, and good to be here with my good friend, uh, Metter, great guy, Admiral Shelton. Nice to be with you, Admiral. Royce, during the Korean War, you were a naval aviator piloting a Grumman F-9F Panther aircraft off the USS Oriskany. And on November 18, 1952, you were involved in an aerial engagement, one of them just 70 miles from the task force. Tell us about that incident. Uh, second flight of my day, I uh, was going on a compound air patrol, very bad blizzard weather uh, where the task force was, uh, through 400 feet to 12,000 feet, uh, solid snowing. Um, a group of four of us, I was the lead of this the section, the section group. On the way through the clouds, our controller from the Oriskany advised us that there were inbound bogies, unknown aircraft, about 100 miles north of us. When we topped the clouds, we were in the clear, and I could see the contrails. About that time, the lead aircraft uh, had a problem with his airplane, and he was directed with his wingman to remain over the task force. And I uh, tested my guns and fighting equipment and ready to go and proceeded uh, toward uh, the incoming airplanes. Which aircraft is more maneuverable, the MiG or the Panther? Uh, maneuverable, climb, speed, the MiG had it all over the Panther. Turn, I don't know, maybe about equal, but it depended a lot on the speed. A slower airplane could tr turn tighter. So how did you become the only defender in this engagement? Well, I lost sight of the airplanes, and they continued in when I next saw them. Four of them were in sight attacking me. All of them were firing, all four. I uh, did a maneuver to get behind that group and found myself in firing position on their number four airplane. And after a short burst, it dropped out of the formation and I was smoking. I became alone because my wingman at that point chose to follow that airplane down. By the time you'd finished this 35 minute gunfight with these four MiGs, did you have any ammo left? No, I was out of ammo. And you went back to the Oriskany, obviously, to refuel and rearm if necessary. Yes, and I was uh, shot up as well. I was pretty heavily damaged. I've seen one report, I think, Admiral, you may have prepared it, that there were over 260 holes in his aircraft. That's correct. When you land on the deck of the Oriskany, what was the first thing that happened when you got back on the aircraft carrier? Well, I was a little exhilaration, but uh, they were at, Combat uh, ready, and so uh, no lollygagging. I went to immediately down to the ready room. So when you get to the ready room, what was discussed about this mission? Well, I was totally surprised because that's our general quarter station. So all the pilots that weren't flying were there in the ready room in their chairs. And nobody said anything because the intelligence officer who was going to do the debriefing had them all swear that they wouldn't say anything until he was through with his business. So we sat there a long time because he wanted to first talk to 
the lead of the flight, who was not engaged and the last one to land and ate up a lot of time so that the yelling from the intelligence center that Washington wanted the information right now became louder and louder and uh, meanwhile, no uh, interrogation. So when the last the plane landed, who again was not involved in the fight, I uh, got there and he denied. So he went through that to the next, the next wingman who uh, was with him. And then to me, and by that time, uh, I had barely enough time to tell him about the initial engagement, and he had to go off and answer the uh, the cries from Washington, and so uh, he knew very little about it except what he may have heard over the teletype uh, in our reading room from the le- relay from the uh, CIC, Combat Information Center. How many folks actually knew that at that time we were able to intercept communications from the Soviet Air Force and the Soviet military and literally engage their forces? How how wide was that knowledge at the time? It wasn't known at all. It was a a new capability. And uh, this was a test with our group aboard the Helena cruiser right off the coast. No one at my level had any idea that we had such capability. So what does Admiral Briscoe, about a week after the engagement, what does Admiral Briscoe do? It was the commander, if I recall correctly, the naval forces in the Far East. And Admiral Briscoe wants to make sure that this word does not get out. What does he tell you, Captain? Well, I was ordered to report to him. I uh, guided to his room. He closed the door. And he said, now what I'm about to tell you, you can never tell anybody ever. And then he complained about the report that went out from the ship, the Oriskany, which followed the debrief that the intelligence officer made up. And so he said, you know, where did he get that wrong information? Well, I hadn't seen the report. I didn't see it until maybe 60 years later. So I didn't know what he was talking about. But anyway, he told me that we had a uh, group of NSA new capability, people with their um, Russian-speaking personnel on the ship following these MiGs from the time of takeoff until he wanted to be, you know, until the remnant came back and tell him that he got at least three. Nobody else knew that that I know. And I never told anybody for years and years. I avoided talking about the issue at all because I might get tripped up and say something that wasn't authorized. So in the aftermath of an event like this, what would be the normal process for recognizing the, her- the heroism and the accuracy of the skill set that were demonstrated in it? What would, what would the award have been? A dis- Distinguished Flying Cross or a Medal of Honor? Well, we had a distinguished commanding officer of the ship that had a couple of Navy crosses. And uh, I got a call from the bridge where Captain Holt Fort, he congratulated and he told me that uh, this award merited the uh, Navy Cross. Of course, he didn't know the facts, nor did our intelligence officer. The idea becomes instead of a Navy Cross, instead of a Medal of Honor, we just got to keep this secret and keep that secret for decades afterwards. Yes, sir. Well, what, what's the recourse now? I mean, obviously, documents have now been modified to acknowledge what happened. The Russians, after the the fall of the wall and, and the end of the Cold War, acknowledged this actually did happen and obviously figured out, hey, somebody's listening to our radio calls and, and able to decrypt them and to translate them on very short notice. Very, very sensitive information at the time. I can understand why the documents don't reflect that. Have they now been modified? Uh, an awfully lot of misinformation came out. Uh, reports supposedly from the ship, uh, Office of Intelligence, uh, message from uh, General Mark Clark, uh, a little disappointed that he was not being cut in on information, which was not true. The report I saw with quotes from me and from the other two recognizers uh, uh, in the flight were not quotes at all. Maybe a one or two, but somebody got fanciful and uh, made up a whole lot of data. So look, 
Why is Royce Williams silenced for 50 years, for crying out loud? Admiral Driscoll told me that you never tell anybody this ever. And the reason for that was we have this new capability of the NSA, National Security Agency, a real hold tight information group of people. And uh, mm -hmm. other than that, uh, it was known. Of course, the enemy knew what happened. They always do. Uh, and the encounter itself was in uh, Stars and Stripes. So I deduce it was the information regarding NSA. So what, what's, what's next? What, what happens from here on out? How, how, Admiral, you've, you've started a movement here to have him properly recognized for his courage and skill. Well, it's my understanding that the, uh, the original request that I forwarded on the 20th of July uh, is in the, is in the uh, uh, Navy Award Board, and it, there is a copy in the SECNAV's office. Now, whether or not that copy is the same one that I sent to the Navy Award Board, I do not know, because there, there are a number of copies uh, uh, gone out now. But anyway, I, I think there is also a copy in the White House that uh, Chief of Staff uh, Meadows, I've been told that. Uh, beyond that, I do not know anything about where the copies are. I have not heard a single word from anybody in Washington. Well, I'm hopeful that this interview and this talk with a real American hero has some influence in Washington and maybe gets the attention of some of these decision makers so that what happened on that day in November of 1952 gets seen as a real American hero doing what needs to be done at the time it has to happen. The bare facts are that uh, Royce and I did not know each other in the service. I was in Korea a year before him and uh, all that. But the, 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 the bare facts are that uh, I'm, I am a combat veteran of three wars. I think I do know the difference between those that do and those that don't. Uh, Royce was one that certainly did. I think that uh, uh, the, the, the major point here, here is that uh, uh, th this was a this was a 35 to 38 minute uh, uh, combat uh, uh, engagement, uh, probably the longest one on history. Uh, but also uh, the, the results were with four down, possibly five down. Uh, this was the, uh, the, the it is, it is simply unmatched uh, either in Korea, in Vietnam or since then. The reason I got into it was that uh, when when they when they finally broke the silence on this thing, uh, I, a, a fellow uh, friend of ours, uh, Rear Admiral Fred Lewis, had Royce down Pensacola for uh, making a speech about it, and uh, I didn't. I was not at that uh, Pensacola, but uh, uh, sometime later I I read Royce's speech, and I said, man. Royce has been screwed over. He's one of those ones that, that, that did and did and did, and he didn't get any credit for it to speak of. So I, uh, I, went, I, I went to Royce one day and I asked him if it was okay if I uh, took this on as a, as a mission. He said yes. So that's about seven and a half years ago. So I took it on and I have worked on it steadily ever since then. And I'm glad I did. Well, I am too. And I admire you for doing so. And folks, if this American Heroes broadcast about a real American hero has been informative and encouraging and inspiring, take time now to subscribe. Until next time, remember, Semper Fidelis is more than a slogan for U.S. Marines. Always faithful is a way of life. Gentlemen, thank you.